Today we're going to go back and revisit the Apostle John who said we were eyewitnesses of Jesus. This is the third uh, time we've been talking about the eyewitnesses of Jesus. And you see, the thing is, is that the New Testament records eyewitness testimony. And th this is what the Apostle Luke had to say, for example, in the beginning of the gospel that bears his name. It says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses. There's that word, eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account to you, O most excellent Theophilus. So we're revisiting John's epistle, 1 John. We're going to be taking a look at just three verses today, just three verses. And let me just read these verses and then we'll get into the study. In fact, I think we'll pray first too. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1 starts off with this. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, he sh we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. So let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you today uh, that we have an opportunity to take a look at these three verses in 1 John about how much you love us. So Father, we thank you that you've loved us. We know that the Bible says that we love you because you first loved us. And we give you all the praise and the glory, Lord, for allowing us to know you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I, I've always loved this verse. Uh, I remember my wife and I, when we were, we were relatively new believers and we had little teeny kids in tow and we were going to a small church and there was no more than maybe 100, 150 people at a worship service. And the, the song leader would use this song, use this song. It was in the Psalter at the time. And it was, a, it was a beautiful song because it used the scripture exactly the way it was written. And it went something like this. It said, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Then it goes on. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. It, w it was fun. I remember that, that uh, we would sing it and sometimes it would even go into a round, you know, where we continue, the men would continue singing the first part and the ladies would sit and sing the second part at the same time. It, it's, it's a beautiful verse and I promise no more singing at least in, until the end. So let's look at what uh, these verses, one verse at a time and see what it is that God is, is actually telling us. So the first verse, it's, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. You know, this scripture is this powerful. It's, it's powerful theology because it takes us beyond our normal day-to-day -day, um, uh, fellowship with each other and with God and describes exactly what God has, has done for us. Uh, the word behold. You know, the word behold we don't use often in English anymore. It's an old English word, but it's a great word. Uh, behold is, is like the word, it's like wait, stop a minute. Pay attention to, to something that you've never seen before. Behold. In fact, in, in the Greek, the, the connotation of the word behold has this idea of to stare, to, to pause for a moment and really understand what is, what is going on. And then it says that we're called the children of God. Uh, this word called means something. You know, in, in ancient times, especially in the Jewish, uh, in, in the Jewish uh, 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 culture, as, as many cultures, uh, but not so much anymore in the United States in the Western culture. But names meant something. To be called something meant something. We, we all know of Indians that are called, you know, uh, you know uh, sits, sits, sits proudly or, or sits with crossed hands or, or raises his fist. Those are, those are names that, that people are called. In, in Hebrew, uh, some of the words make, make a lot of sense. Like, for example, Jesus, the name Jesus means God is salvation. You know, when Jesus is walking around Judea as a boy and they call his name Jesus, they're saying God is salvation. Uh, Jesus changed the name from Simon to, to Peter. Peter, which, which means a stone or a rock. The angel Gabriel 
has a name. It's, it's the mighty one of God, Gabriel. And you know, there's actually a, an angel that's even mightier than Gabriel, and that's Michael. And the word Michael is he who is God, or he who is like God. So, so we too are to be called children of God. And that, and that is supposed to mean something. It, it, it resonates. It resonates as we, as we understand that God has called us to be children of God. And then it's, and it's we. Now, the, here's the, the interesting thing. It's we are called the children of God. But you know, here's, here's the Bible truth is that all, all the people of the world are not necessarily the children of God. All of us are creation. All of us are, are, are people that have been sons of Adam. We've all been created by God. But we aren't all children of God. And, and the reason is, is take, take a look at the very next verse. It says, therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. You see, the revelation is, is that unless you know God through Jesus Christ, you really aren't a child of God. God is in the reconciliation business. He sent Jesus to die on a cross for us to reconcile us back to him. And as a result, we can become children of God. But until we understand who Jesus is, we really don't know God, and we can't be called children of God. Now, being a child of God doesn't necessarily make us more important, doesn't necessarily give us privilege. Actually, it gives us responsibility. The responsibility is this, you know, Jesus sat down and called the 12 together and he said, anyone, this is Mark 9, 35, anyone who wants to be first must be the last and be the servant of all. You know, one of the ways we serve humanity is by, is by serving them. And one of the ways we serve them is by telling them about Jesus. There's probably nothing better than being able to tell your family, your neighbors, and your friends about Jesus. Uh, Jesus commanded us to do that. It's called the Great Commission. And this is what it says. It says, therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all things that I've commanded you, and surely I will be with you until the end, the very end of this age. You know, Jesus gave this commandment to his apostles shortly before he ascended into heaven. It was the last thing that he, he told them, is to go and, and make disciples and, and teach, the, teach the world about, about Jesus. So let's go on. Uh, part two, the second verse. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. And I want to pause there for a moment because all of a sudden it says something that we don't know. It's not yet been revealed what we shall be like when we see Jesus. You know, I, I love teaching eschatology. Eschatology is basically the study of last things. And, and the Bible has a lot to say about the second coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, one out of every five verses has something to say about the coming of the Messiah and the second coming. So we need to pause for a moment because for some reason we don't know much about what we will be like. It says it hasn't been yet revealed to us. But, but here's, here's the good news, and it's, and it's all good news. It's going to be better than we even expect. Better than we even expect. You know, Carol and I came back just recently from a couple-week trip. It was a, a trip of a lifetime, something that we had been planning it literally for 25, 30 years, to be able to get to Hawaii and to be able to just to relax and enjoy the, the sunshine and see this, this beautiful land, this beautiful, this beautiful island uh, called Hawaii. And uh, so it was a whole year of planning, and Carol's the planner. And it was interesting because we were honored to not only see uh, the Hawaii as, as a visitor, but we really wanted to experience all the islands, Oahu, Hawaii, Maui, and, and Kauai. We wanted, to see it, we wanted to see it all. And then finally came the day where, where Carol booked, uh, booked, uh, booked the flight and, and, and booked the, the cruise. And we had a countdown on our computer. It, was, it started off at like 285 days, then it was 166 days, and then 118 days, 95 days, and then it was a, a, a upon us. And, and we loved the trip, took lots of pictures. It was, it, was a, it was a wonderful trip. We were so blessed. And here's the thing, when people said, what did you think of Hawaii? The thing I, I like to respond with, it was better than we expected. It was better than we expected. It was, it was amazing. The colors were brilliant. In fact, here's a, here's a picture of, 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 of something that we just, just took from our, our cell phone, just kind of snapped the picture of, of the vistas and, and what it looked like. It was an amazing, amazing trip. And, and this is exactly what Paul is telling us. This is what the Apostle John is telling us. And then Paul echoes it as well, that 
what we can expect is even better than we could hope for. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians 2.9, it says, however, as it is written, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who loved him. You see, the thing is, is God just has not yet revealed it yet. And I think that's a good thing. There's, there's a little bit of mystery what it's going to be like. We, we know that we're included, and we know that Jesus is coming back for us, but we're not quite sure exactly what it's going to be like. And I like that. So let's go on. Uh, verse 2b, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. John is saying that we will see him. The Bible says that when Jesus returns, all of us, and that's all of the we, all who have received him, all of us will be transformed, will be changed. You see, here's the thing. From the time we accept Jesus Christ, and from the very first time that the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, we start changing. We start being transformed. We become different than we were before. I, I know for myself, uh, going back 38, 39 years now, uh, my life has, has changed. I'm not the same person that I was. Thank God. Uh, if you knew me before, you wouldn't have liked me, okay? Things are, things are changing, and, and God is still working uh, with me on things like trust and patience and, and love and, and what, what it means to be long-suffering. I'm still far from perfect, but I'm changing. But here's the thing. There will be a day when we are complete, and we're complete when Jesus comes back for us, and we are, we are changed. We are, we are then complete. So, so don't give up. You see, God has, has plans for us. You know, have you ever seen those bumper stickers? It says, it says, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven. I'm not a big fan of bumper stickers, but I kind of like that one. I'm not perfect, I'm, I'm just forgiven. But there is a, a completion day coming. There's, there's a time coming when we will be like him. And then the transformation is over. It's this, is a, this is an emotional, a spiritual, even a physical transformation. Our, our, we get new bodies. Uh, for those of you that are my age and older, that's, that's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So let's go on. This is the last, verse 3 out of the three verses. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now here's, here's the thing. This word purify can be a little scary. I mean, when you think about it, what do you do to purify things? You, you drop clothing into boiling water, you, 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 you put things on the microwave and turn it up to nuke, you take your dishes and you put them in the dishwasher and, and turn it on to pot, pot scrubber, you know, it's, it's hot, it's steamy, to purify means to get rid of all of those impurities and, and the process typically is, is pretty scary and, and how can we be purified? Well, here's the thing, one of the hints that we have in the New Testament is what Jesus said in, in Matthew 5, 8, this is the Sermon on the Mount. And he basically said, remember the Beatitudes? Blessed are you. Blessed means happy. He says this. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You see, the question is, how can you be pure in heart? Well, if you understand the Hebrew culture, the heart was the center of everything. Not, you know, in our in our culture, the heart is the center of emotions, but we still have our, our mind, we think, but not in the Hebrew culture. In the Hebrew culture, being pure of heart was to be single-minded, single-minded. In Proverbs 23, 7, it says, as a man thinks in his heart, get that? As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So to be pure in heart, the way that God purifies us is to give us a single-minded attitude towards who, who God is and what our true intention is, what our, what our purpose is. You know, I'm going to end this the same way I started it, by just singing this verse and letting you hear the words again with my, my poor, <laughs> ineffective, not yet transformed, not yet completed voice. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the sons of God, that we should be called the sons of God. Let's pray.